The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Well, as we near the end of the month of July, that can always add a little bit of volatility and uncertainty into our market picture. Plus, we're continuing to watch weather forecasts, of course, that have had an impact particularly on soybeans here the last few sessions. Just a lot of pressure there. And really just an overall kind of bearish outlook still for the grain trade. Livestock's been a mixed bag. Let's talk about some of the different chart features we're watching and just some Good perspective on these markets here as we wrap up the month of July. Joining us now for a conversation, Brian Split with agmarket.net. Brian, welcome back to the show, buddy. How are you? I am doing great, Jesse. Thanks for having me, as always. You bet. Well, thank you for being here. And I, I think this is a, a perfect time for you and me to catch up and, and sit down and talk about these markets because, as I alluded to, especially the grains, it's just been a a very bearish tone. Weather has been pretty friendly for the most part. I know we had a maybe a little weather-led rally early last week, but then we've given all that back and then some, it feels like, particularly in soybeans. I mean, just this overall grain market picture, not necessarily friendly right now. And I know a lot of producers aren't very happy with some of the price points they're seeing right now, Brian. Right. I mean, I, I guess the bottom line right now for grains is we are in a bear market. Um, I don't think anybody can deny that. And that was one of the themes that we, uh, you and I, have talked about uh, rather extensively over the last several months is the idea of the similarities between a decade ago, really starting in 2020 versus 2010. Uh, but all that culminated in highs made in 2012 and 2022 for different reasons. One was drought, one was the invasion of a, a major grain producer. But 2023 and 2013 were transition years from bull market to bear market. And 2014 really entrenched us into that bear market as we're seeing right now in 2024. Um, so the problem is we... we get these little short covering rallies, but we think about what happened last week and you, you alluded to that uh, with the weather. Um, number one, the, the weather itself uh, was friendly for a short period of time. And have we had we come out of the weekend with additional hot and dry, uh, then maybe we could have gotten a little bit more out of it, but we didn't. Uh, and as a matter of fact, rain fell in areas where it was not forecasted. Uh, and that is the type of uh, atmosphere we're in right now. There's a lot of energy in the atmosphere. It's humid as all get out. And you get these ridge rider storms over the ridge that comes. And so that tends to pop up in areas that where it's not forecasted. So um, if you keep seeing that type of weather pattern that we're in right now, uh, it's going to be difficult to get more than what we got last week. And I think the funds realizing that, hey, we're record short beans and we're just coming off of a record short in corn they did cover positions based on that forecast, but they did it very delicately. Uh, and what I mean by that is they took the market right up to resistance and then they would stop buying. And then just the act of them not buying anymore brought the market back down. And then the next day they'd buy a little bit more, take it back up there, and then they'd stop. And you might've noticed that corn last week had three days in a row where the funds basically bought from 8.30 to 10.30 and then they just stopped. And then the rest of the day, we would just kind of fizzle out. Uh, so the improvement in the weather really turned things back to the lows. Beans made new lows for the move. Uh, corn is right back to the lows. And so I, I think it's eventual that we're going to see corn make new lows. And, and we're going to be coming into an August WASDE report where there's going to be a lot of questions about what the USDA is going to do with yield. Yeah, very, very big report coming up here for the month of August. And I think about this. You mentioned the fund positioning, and I've been talking about this on the show for the last couple of weeks now. You got the funds on the one side, you got commercials uh, on the other. And I think a lot of farmers kind of caught in between here, in, in particular for any old crop that they're still hanging on to. And as we wrap up July, move into August, I know that the clock is ticking for uh, any folks who are hanging on to any sort of old crop right now as uh, things are just kind of getting squeezed, it feels like, in this environment, Brian. So, Jesse, I'm glad you said that word squeezed um, because that is what is happening. Um, and it is unfortunate, but that's the reality of the situation. And it works in both directions. Uh, the fund manager, and, and not a single person, but as an entity in general, their job is to find who is out of position in any given market and push it. 
and they try to push it through levels where then it, it gets worse. So the fund manager is very well aware of the cost of this crop. They know that the crop uh, is expensive and they know we're below the cost of production right now. Um, they know the producer is in a bad position and they're going to push it. Um, and whether that's right or wrong, uh, that's a different conversation. But remember, a couple of years ago, it worked in the opposite direction. And the fund manager was the producer's best friend because they were reaching record long positions. And the person that was out of position was not the producer. It was the end user that didn't have the product. They were caught short in an environment where global production had major concerns. So the bottom line is, is this. Um, right or wrong, morally, for what the funds are doing, the producer has tools to prevent this from happening. They have to make the decision to use them. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's something that uh, we talk about so much. And yet I, I know some folks are a little bit, there's a little trepidation in using some of those tools, even still in, in this kind of market environment, Brian. And I know that obviously the tools in the toolbox can vary for specific operations, but it feels to me like in this market environment, if you've been hesitant to use some of these different strategies and tools that are out there, you got to put that aside to protect your risk at this point. Right. So um, we think about 2014. And again, that's the that analog year that we've been comparing to. And so <clears throat> unfortunately, if we follow that path, we do have quite a bit lower to go. Mm -hmm. um, the fall low on December corn 10 years ago was 318 and a quarter. So you're talking, uh, you know, another 80 cents, right, uh, of, of value that we could lose. Um, you talk about soybeans and that was 904. So we're talking, you know, about a, a buck 20 there. Uh, and the thing with beans is they're actually trading worse than in 2014. So the movement timing is very similar, but we're lo at lower levels. Uh, corn is trading a little bit better than 20, 2014. I think I just said 2019 than 2014. So we're, we're actually doing a little bit better. Again, timing of moves is similar, but we're holding a little bit of premium currently to where we were at this time in 2014. But I think this is the environment where if you have risk, there's only a couple things you can do. Um, buying a put stops the bleeding. You know what your cost is. If you buy a put at the lows and the market goes up 50 cents, yes, you're going to be pissed you bought the put, but you're going to be happy the market went up and rallied. But the alternative is that if we break through $4 on December corn and make a leg to 380 and then we try to bounce and then we make a leg to 365 and try to bounce and then we go to 350, uh, it's going to be a painful two months in front of you. So it's either that or you just sell the physical because it's not just a flat price risk when you're talking old crop, especially you've got basis risk uh, because eventually that old crop is going to start being treated as new crop. And yes, basis has been pretty good here as we get to the tail end of the, the marketing year, but there's going to be a lot of bushels that were planted early that are doing very well. They're going to be competing with old crop relatively soon. And I think, too, on that point with basis, there's been some push bids out there. And especially if you have a good relationship with your local end user, there, there might be some opportunity here if you're if you're kind of caught in a position here over the next couple of weeks to take advantage of some of those relationships and some of those push bids, Brian. Right. Uh, you know, there's a posted bid and, you know, sometimes if you ask nicely and say, please, they may give you a little bit of a basis push, especially <laughs> depending on the quantity that you're talking. If you're talking a higher volume of bushels, then you're more likely to get a little bit of a push. Uh, you know, I don't know what situation your neighbors are in, but if your neighbors have bushels, you might want to talk to uh, your neighbor about pulling them together and making a larger uh, 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 delivery between the two of you where you can get some additional basis. Uh, just things to think about. But again, the bottom line right now, I mean, that, that extra couple cents on your basis isn't, isn't the problem right now. Uh, the problem for the most part is going to be a, a, another leg lower and a flat price move. 
We're talking with Brian Split from agmarket.net here today on Market Talk. Brian, how about new crop? I mean, a lot of the same dynamics at play there, but obviously more time. I think a lot of uh, folks are starting to have an idea anyway of what their crop is going to look like here this year, uh, barring any late season issues. And, and I know a lot of times we've talked about, you know, l- kind of dipping your toe in the water, so to speak. If you haven't really started with any sales, at least getting something rolling, you don't have to sell the whole farm at one price, I think is is the big thing to think about here, right? Right. Um, you know, and, and hopefully, I know that there's a lot of areas where this is not the case, but hopefully um, you're in an area where your, your bushels have uh, improved over the last several weeks with some rainfall. Maybe you've got a little bit more to market, which is going to always help. Uh, but I, I think this may be a year also where if you are caught behind the curve um, and we do make another major leg lower, uh, you're going to have to be in, in a position where you have the ability to turn around and buy some calls. Um, you know, if this market does reach the low to mid threes, I don't think it's just going to go there and stay there. I think we're going to have the ability to turn around and, and make a punch back up later in the year into the, uh, the end of the calendar year. Uh, we are ch- seeing a seasonal shift. Uh, when I talk seasonals, there's just general tendencies in the market, harvest lows, right? That type of idea. Well, I think seasonals are going to change for soybeans, for example, because now it's Brazil is the uh, the dominant exporter, right? Most of the uh, the export business to China is, is coming from Brazil and it's probably going to continue to be that way. And so I think the seasonal tendencies can change where now we're going to get maybe uh, in a pattern where we need to focus on selling soybeans during the South American weather market. And that might be a a stronger weather market than our own domestic one. Um, So as we get into fall, early winter, that would kind of be a similar time frame for our domestic uh, market for the Northern hemisphere. Um, So I think you have to be ready to do some marketing as we get into uh, the later part of fall, early part of winter, especially on soybeans. Um, But there, there's going to be some movement. Uh, we're not. I, I don't think we're going to just stay at a static price if we have another leg lower. I think there's going to be a volatility, and and you might need to be creative to help try and help add value to your your sales. Um, and interest is going to be another conversation where you know do you keep, want to keep paying interest on on the money on these bushels? Um, and so if you decide to part ways with a, a lot of bushels here come harvest. We want to have a way to maintain some kind of ownership on paper of those bushels with a known risk. Yeah, that's a good point too. That storage cost, the interest on that is uh, another piece of the puzzle that uh, really got to think about here at this window. Let's talk livestock a little bit, Brian. And I know this hog market in particular, you got some thoughts there, some of the uh, chart moves we've seen recently. I know we've had a really sizable futures rally maybe running out of steam here potentially in the last session or so. What's your thoughts in this hog market right now, Brian? Right. So we had kind of a really hot uh, export market, a lot of butts going to Mexico. Uh, As of late, it appears the Mexican buyers are kind of pumping the brakes a little bit because of the increase in in prices. Uh, From a a chart standpoint, uh, and I'm looking at the October contract, we had a really big break. Anybody that watches hogs knows what I'm talking about from April all the way into July. So it was a, a three month and it was just a, a devastating move. Um, but it took about 11 sessions to ha- take half of that break back, right? So three months of selling and then in 11 days, half of that move, we recover. Um, and so that move took us right back to some highs that we made in mid June, very strong resistance level. Um, so we should expect this pullback that we've gotten into the mid 74s. I think it's really critical for 74 to hold. Uh, if it does, that would look like a, a big head and shoulder bottom. Uh, and we'd have to get through last week's highs to confirm that, but that would measure all the way back up to contract highs if it did that. Um, now for me, if I'm a producer realizing that we just took back half of that break, uh, in a very short period of time. This is probably a, an area to layer some coverage under you and hope that we get through that that 78 area. Because if we do, I think we could see an explosive move higher. So me, you know, I'm willing to lose a couple bucks on some puts with a known risk, but having coverage and hope that we see another 10 bucks higher here over the next couple months. 
Uh, it's going to have to continue to come from very strong demand. So we'll see if the buyers balk and balk for a longer period of time. And if they do, then we're going we're gonna to go right back to the lows. Uh, but if they decide that this pullback is a time where they want to come right back in and get some more needs covered, we could see this market uh, trade pretty firm here into the end of the quarter. And I think for a lot of uh, folks in that hog market in particular, with things being so beat down here early this year, nice to see some uh, uptick here. And hopefully we can hold some of those support levels that you mentioned. Demand, of course, is going to be a big thing. Demand on the beef side, too, is, is something I've been watching in particular as we kind of work through the seasonals here right now, through the summer months uh, for everything. Beef, pork, chicken, you name it. Labor Day coming up in September is going to be our, our next big grilling holiday here domestically i look at the cattle market brian i see a little caution maybe in both fats and feeders maybe getting toppy again i, I don't know what do you what's your perspective on the cattle trade right now so cattle seems to be in this cycle where as long as the cash stays strong that lead contract, the front month, will hang out, right? And we've seen some some pretty wide basis levels. Uh, but as we get close to expiration, that contract then tends to jump up to where cash is. That's what the June contract did. August will likely do that if cash stays firm here as we get into the, the dog days of summer. But um, my concern is as we get into like October and then December, and you look at December having traded almost up to 190 here this week. And um, will we be trading at you know the same record cash levels come fourth quarter as we're heading into winter like we saw uh, and at the beginning of summer? And I, I think I'm hesitant to think that we will. Um, I, didn't, I know we're not re rebuilding the herd, but the weights are up tremendously. And I don't know. I, uh, maybe I'm I'm just concerned about the economy and I shouldn't be, but everything I just read about, you know, mortgage delinquencies and mm -hmm. the uh, credit card debt that's out there. And, and I feel like the American is spending, out be, uh, you know, outside of their means. I could be wrong, uh, but that just is the sense I get when I read some of this economic data of what the consumer is doing. Um, and so it, we've seen some really negative trade recently in equities. Uh, the NASDAQ and the S&P went to the uptrend from last October's lows. So this is a really strong uptrend, um, and we're holding it. But if we see the equity market start to falter going into the election, who knows what's going to happen? This is a pretty interesting several uh, months we have ahead of us. Uh, I'm concerned about what that would lead to sentiment-wise for the cattle market. The uptrend that we've been in in cattle has been four years old, right? And so we had a, a an uptrend, you know, about a decade ago in, in cattle that lasted for five years. This one's been a little bit more steep of an angle that we've been traveling in. But bottom line, if we take out the area of 180, so the June contract made lows of 180.92 during the month of June. The August contract this month made lows of 180.82. So we're holding it right now. But if we get on the other side of 180, we're taking out this uptrend that we've been in for the last four years. And I think the fund manager is going to say, okay, the trade's done. Um, we don't want to be long anymore. But that likely means that if they don't want to be long anymore, they're going to want to go short. Um, mm -hmm. And so, again, I think you just have to be aware of the level that's really important below the market and protect it. And if we don't take it out, great. The market's either going to go sideways or hopefully higher. But I think there's a lot of risk out there, especially when you think about the similarities in cattle as to corn, right? We talked about the high input price of corn and the cost it, it took to grow this crop. You think about the inputs on the cattle side right now and the cost of calves and boy, oh boy, if the fund manager decides that the cattle feeder is out of position and they want to take this thing the other way, it's going to hurt. So let's, let's avoid that. Again, the tools are out there to prevent that. Yeah, a lot of dynamics at play. You mentioned the economy. I know the Fed meeting uh, this week, today, tomorrow. Um, obviously, a lot of the same concerns you have about the economy, I have them as well. Um, yeah, I think about my bill at the grocery store when it's two, three, four times higher than it was five years ago. Um, a lot of folks feeling that pinch across the country right now, and it's a lot of concern for sure. Um, Brian, can I make one more point about equities real quick? Yeah, um, please do. Please do. Yeah. 
a lot of the major highs that have been seen in previous history, and again, this market's been uptrending forever, but there have been some extreme corrections, right? And in the uh, environment where interest rates have been low and then they've moved them to high, the market still rallies in that period as interest rates are going up. When the market generally makes a major top and then corrects into a you know a bear market for how, however long, is when the Fed decides that they need to start lowering rates again. It's like admitting there's a problem, right? And then that's when the equity market starts to come into pressure. So I'm interested to see if the Fed does lower rates here, uh, if that doesn't have an overall negative impact on the equity trade. So again, just wanted to throw that out there. No, thank you. I, I think that's a, a great point to make and something for us to watch for, for sure. Brian, uh, real quick, any other final thoughts you would share? Anything you want to reiterate to folks listening in today? Yeah, I mean, just so you guys realize, you know, what our job is. Um, we talked about different ways of doing things and different tools. And so our job is to talk to you and get to know your operation and your own risk profile, right? Maybe you don't want margin calls. There's, there's ways to protect yourself without the mar potential of margin call. Generally, if you put yourself in a marginal position and it's positioned the correct way for the market, it will do better. Uh, but you can still do very fine with non-marginable positions, but there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. There's a lot of tools that we use. So find somebody that can just help you know what your options are, explain it to you, how it works, and then help you make a decision that at least protects you in a way that you feel comfortable with. Great thoughts. And I know if they want to work with you or the rest of the team there at agmarket.net, take a look at your intel and much more. Everything is available online, agmarket.net. I know you guys have a lot of great resources there, don't you, Brian? We do. Uh, a lot of good resources, and we have an app that you can use to track expenses and sales. So uh, check us out. If you want a free trial of something, uh, get, jump online, let us know. And you can reach us directly at 844-4-AG-MARKET, so 844-424-6758. Brian Split with agmarket.net. Always good to talk with you, my friend. Thanks for joining us on Market Talk. We'll get you back on the show again soon. Sounds good, Jesse. Appreciate it. Thank you. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube.